All right, I guess it's time to get started. So, hi everyone, it's good to see you. My name is Greg. I've been working on the Seth Distributed Software System since 2009. It's been a long time. Um, last time I gave this talk, it took about 37 minutes and I tried to cut it down, but we'll see how it goes, um, which means that if you have a question that comes up that you want to ask, maybe raise your hand to yell out it while I'm talking so that in case we run out of time, you get your questions answered. Um, who here wants th came because they think they want to learn something about Ceph? Good. <laughs> okay, who, who here mostly does testing during their day job? Okay, who mostly writes software during their day job? All right, good mix. Excellent. Okay, so we got like three slides that I'm going to do as fast as I can about Ceph just so we know what problem we're dealing with. So Ceph is a distributed storage system. It provides object block and file interfaces to people who want hundreds of pet terabytes or petabytes of data. Um, a Ceph cluster is, is built on top of the reliable autonomic distributed object store, which is responsible for actually storing data and serving I.O. And that Rados cluster is composed of mostly object storage demons, which actually are involved in serving every I.O. and doing data replication and recovering from failures. And then a very small number of these monitors, which we're not going to worry, which we really don't need to worry about right now, that just sort of say, okay, here's who's in the cluster, but aren't involved in data movement. So if you write an application that runs against the Ceph Rados cluster, then you've got a big cluster. Even a small one is probably several dozen dozen demons running all together. And then the application just talks to it via a library binding, set of library bindings. So if you want to test the Ceph cluster, it's a little complicated. You can't just sort of go, like if you want to do power off testing, you can't just flip one switch and turn it off. Or maybe you have a big giant data center switch that you can turn off, but then you don't have a test system running either. Um, so we needed some way to do testing of Ceph. And so we came up with Toothology. Toothology is the academic study of cephalopods. So it's just a pun on the name. Um, and it started about seven years ago. So in 2011, I had been working as a very wet behind the ears software developer for a couple of years. And it was mostly me and a couple other people sitting in a room together. And I, I was the new guy. Someone else had started the project several years earlier. But we really needed to formalize step testing. At least once, we had a situation where we ran a, where we ran a test, like you know FIO or something. And we said, hmm, there was a bug. And, they tracked, and we tracked it down. And we said, oh, like this if condition is, is backwards. So we swapped it. And then a few weeks later, one of the other three people in the room ran a test and tracked down a, and found a bug and they tracked it down and they said, huh, this if condition is backwards and they swapped it. And we eventually realized that they were the same if condition and it wasn't, you didn't take account of enough state, but because we were just sort of running tests ad hoc out of shell scripts on our laptops when we felt like it, then we didn't have a good way of identifying that problem. And so we really needed a solution. Luckily, we hired a guy who was much smarter about testing and administration than I was, named TV. And he set out to try and build us a test system. The first one involved using auto test, but it just didn't work great. And we couldn't find anything that was accessible to us that would work for distributed systems, because they were all mostly set up around single nodes. And we really, really needed to be able to say, hey, that machine needs to turn off, or we need to kill this process running on that machine over there. So TV sat down, and he wrote some Python code. And and he called it an orchestra module. And the purpose of orchestra was to let us SSH into remote machines and do things to them. And it sort of it presented, it presented these machines as Python objects. One of them was a cluster object, and you could run commands on every node in the cluster, or you know, a filtered set of nodes in the cluster, or get a single node out of the cluster and save that and run a bunch of commands on that one node. And you know, that worked. It let us control clusters. And so then he created the Toothology test running system. Toothology's, Toothology was built up around Orchestra, and its job was to take a list of tasks that you gave it, like set up a Ceph cluster, and then you know mount a kernel client, and then run some tests on it, and run those tests, those tasks, on target nodes um, in ways that are defined by rules, which I will just illustrate here real quickly. So a target, a set of targets is just a list of users and machines that you can log into, eat, log into with SSH without passwords so that the system can automatically log in. Roles are a mapping from 
kinds of demons into nodes in the cluster. Now, in our examples, these are going to be Ceph-based because we're testing Ceph, but, it, but the roles that are available are not defined by the Tuthology framework. They're interpreted by the tasks. And so in this role, we have you know, a monitor on each of three nodes and a couple of OSDs, and a this is a metadata server, and then a client role. Um, and then the tasks are lists of other kinds of Python code. And we got a question. This sounds a lot like you invented Ansible in the one <laughs> It's a lot. Okay, so I actually know very little about Ansible as a as a as, as a front end technology, but yes, Ansible was not really available at the time, <laughs> um, or maybe it was available, but we, no one had heard of it. <laughs> um, yeah. So and then, we, but like this list of tasks, each of these tasks is actually a separate Python code file. Um, and so the Ceph one says, you know, install and set up Ceph. This is a one, one for mounting the kernel client. And then this, work, this is a work unit one, which is a generic one that lets us invoke um, shell code tests. And it's going to invoke it on all of the clients in the system. And this particular one is the dbench.shell script. Um, the tasks are kind of interesting. They can be something called context managers, which basically means that they don't need to execute all in one go. The Ceph task actually sets up a cluster, and then it runs the yield command. And, another command, and then another test can run after it while the Ceph cluster is running, and then when they return execution flow these back to the Ceph task, then it does the teardown of the cluster and the cleanup. And then Tuthology automatically can combine individual YAML files into a single test, so you can like have a have a file that's your targets to run on because these are my machines, and then you just like keep on changing the the particular test you want to run by changing the kclient dbench.yaml file to something else, and it automatically combines those YAML fragments into a single test job, which I think is familiar in many test systems now, but. I don't know, it was the first time I saw it. And when it's done with a job, the Tuthology logs all that output into an archive directory you specify. So you have a set of, this is probably pretty small, but you have a remote folder that contains all the logs from all the nodes that were in the system. You have a Tuthology log file that's the actual test running, running output. You have a summary.yaml file that specifies whether the test failed or succeeded. If it failed, it has a reason, whatever, whatever failure condition it triggered it, the original config that was used, the version of Ceph it was run on, stuff like that. Um, now that was seven years ago, and TV was smart, but it was still only you know a couple weeks or maybe a couple months for time for him. So it's a little bigger and different today. Um, Tuthology today is mostly but not exclusively used inside of the upstream sepia lab. This is about 250 machines that are available to the Ceph community. I think they're physically hosted by the Red Hat Open Source and Standards Group, but it's just it's it's not controlled by anyone. It's anyone except for the Ceph community itself. And it's devoted to running Ceph tests full time. And we grant SSH access to any engaged developer. Um, so it's a big system, and it takes a little more than just sitting there at your desktop and being like, oh, like run this test now. So first of all, we have a locking server so that we can say, hey, I need three nodes. Give me three nodes that aren't going to get trampled on by someone else. And you can use this to grab a targets file in addition to actually locking them. Second of all, maybe all the ser servers in the system are busy right now, so you can't lock any. So you can schedule a job to run later at some later date instead of running it immediately from your desktop. And when you do that, it just assembles the YAML files, puts them into a Beanstalk queue, and then we have a Tuthology server running with a bunch of worker processes that sit there and go, hey, is there a job I can run off of the Beanstalk queue? Oh, there is. OK, this job takes three nodes. Let me lock three nodes. Hey, I locked three nodes. Let me execute this job. Hey, I'm done with the job. Let me store the log files. Um, and instead of, yeah. So we have the lock server, and we have schedule. And instead of actually scheduling individual jobs, we instead tend to schedule suites. So suites, obviously, um, well, suites do test a specific category of the Ceph interface. We have suites for the file system. We have suites for the underlying Rados object store. We have suites for our S3 compliant gateway. We got suites for a lot of different things. And in particular, instead of being a full collection, a full listing of all the tests we want to run, suites are actually directories of YAML fragments that we can combine. 
and this mean, and this is really useful because it means that if we want to add a new test for a new API we built up, then instead of having to do all of the different combinations of things we need to test against that API, we just add a new API, a new test this API YAML fragment, and the system picks it up against all the other stuff. So in this example, this is a trimmed down version of our Rados Verify suite. And we've got a couple of different YAML configs that are going to run on everything. And we've got a description of the cluster. And we can choose whether we want to do thrashing against the cluster or not, which we'll talk about later. We have a couple of different local object stores that run on a single hard drive. And so we can configure different ones of those. And then we have different tasks. We've got one for testing whether the monitors recover, for whether the APIs actually work, and for something that we call class. And so when we run a run Tuthology suite, then it'll first say, okay, well, you know, we run, we include both the YAML files in the top level directory, and then I go into the clusters directory and I'm going to pick out some files, and oh, this directory is tagged so that we actually use both files in this directory for all the tests. But in the thrash directory, we pick one YAML file, so I'm going to pick the no, we're not going to thrash YAML file. In the object store directory, we're going to run on XFS with our file store backend, and I'm going to run the class tests. And then the next test is all the same things except for running the API tests. And the next test is all the same things except for running the monitor tests. And then the next test, we're going to switch to Blue Store and iterate through all the, all the tests again. So it's, it's a combinatorial explosion, but it's very useful. Because I, when I add a new thing, it's like, hey, I need to verify that my new, um, I don't know, that my new thing works. <laughs> then I add a new task that says, hey, like, test that I successfully mount and unmount correctly if I, have, if I found a bug that does it 30 times, where 30 times in a row it doesn't work. And then it still tests against all the backends and things. We have a whole bunch of suites, so coverage is pretty good. And I mentioned the thrash directory. So this is a very important part of testing Ceph. Ceph's purpose in life is to deal with failures. So we actually need to test it against failures. You may have heard of the Netflix chaos monkey. That's a very popular concept today. It probably, we probably read a news article before you wrote this, but it's just sort of a thing you have to do. So it's, a, it's one of those tasks that runs in the background, and it runs around and does things to the cluster. We have, ta we have thrashers that you can configure to turn OSDs on and off randomly, but you know only so many at a time, so the cluster should still work, or maybe enough that it doesn't still work, you can configure it. And we have thrashers that let you change the way data is sharded across the cluster or force a, force a um, a reshuffle of the data so it has to move while I.O. is still happening, things of that nature. And this is, these are very important to testing this, the recovery state space of Ceph. So that's sort of an overview of the Tuthology you know, user interface. But it's also important to talk about how we use it. So first of all, we test the development branch. I can write some code up and say, all right, I think this might be ready. Or you know, I think this one thing works, and I want to make sure that this one thing works, but I'm not ready for, for a pull request yet. So I can push that code to our cephci.git repository. And we have a system that automatically builds packages out of anything that gets pushed there. And then I can schedule a job in the CPU lab to test that to test that code and I can get it to email me or I or anyone else can just go look at our Pulpito website that reports all the jobs that passes and failures and lets you look at logs. Second of all, after branches are tested you know, by the individual developer, we test every pull request that comes into the system. We use GitHub. We, can get, we get a lot of pull requests from people that we don't know and a lot of pull requests from people we do know but don't have quite good, as good testing as we do. So we have to test all that before we merge into the system. Tech leads and people who do a lot of reviews have some tools to help them. But basically, we go through. We, we make sure that a branch is in good enough state that we think it's worth to actually testing on. We merge it into an integration branch with three or four or five other pull requests, and we run them through whatever suite is appropriate or whatever sets of suites are appropriate, and we look for problems. And again, those results are publicly available. If there are no problems, then hooray, we can merge that code, assuming everyone's ready, for, everyone agrees. If there are problems, we figure out why. We go back and report to that pull request, and hopefully we get an update that goes through it again. But it's very important. Nothing merges into the set project without passing the, the appropriate set of tests. Um, so our master branch, you know, things get in sometimes, but it's pretty stable. 
Um, and finally, we actually do nightly testing. So Ceph's a big, complicated distributed system. Sometimes there are races that will only turn up one in 10 runs, or one in 100, or even one in several thousand. And so we run nightly tests all the time against you know, the in-development code. We run tests, nightly tests against the, against the stable branches that, we're, that we are supporting upstream as long-term stable. Table, things of that nature. Depending on the tests, they'll mostly run every. They run between every other week and every night, and those results are also publicly available. So that's all the ways that Toothology is great. There are some problems with it, some gaps that I'm going to tell you about. But I do want to. <laughs> Before I tell you the awful things about my project, I want to say, okay, I think we're pretty good at testing. Um, we, we do a lot of functional coverage. I've sort of run through just the framework about, that we use for it, but we have a lot of specific stuff inside of that framework to make it work well. We have this Ceph test Rados thing that can issue arbitrary numbers, like you know, we run it for hours at a time of, of Rados operations, for, of reads and writes, and, and more complicated things against the cluster, and verify that the results are exactly what we expect to get back and we run that against all kinds of thrashers that do all kinds of terrible things to the system we deliberately inject failures with like two demons we inject failures within demons we have we have code in the Ceph base that we can set to just trigger and assert at particular at important places and make sure that the system recovers correctly we have code that can inject de delays in delivering messages or in granting locks to try and expose those races we we go out and we as it says we fiddle with the raw objects or with the raw disk state and we make sure that the cluster detects that and recovers it in the ways we and then recovers from it or, resp or at least responds to it in the ways that we expect. And Toothology is not the only way we do testing. We have a make, check, build target in our repository that runs. We have, it's not as good as we'd like it to be, but we do have unit tests that test actual like code modules built around the G-Test framework all the way up to, uh, up to um, user interface tests that turn on a very small local stuff daemon cluster and issue all the commands that you can issue to the system and make sure that that reacts correctly when you issue the command or when you issue the command incorrectly. So some of the other components in the system, such as our Ceph Ansible, which we use for deployment in most cases, or the Ceph Volume thing that we use for provisioning, they all have their, they have their own test frameworks that they get used for. Um, but with that said, there are some pretty important gaps that we've discovered over the years. First of all, Toothology handles daemons by SSHing into, a, into the test node and directly invoking them. That gives us a lot of cool features very cheaply, like the ability to, to issue standard in and receive standard out and, and signal stuff without going through hoops. But it means that we don't test, well, now it's systemd or in the past upstart or sys5 init scripts. And sometimes that can be a problem, like when you expect your script to only allow three restarts in 10 minutes, but actually it's just restarting infinitely and so when there's a failure that you expect that it causes an assert that you expect to kill the demon it just never goes away um, second of all, Toothology does its own package installs and cluster configuration. Now, when Toothology was created in 2011, we really expected that most of our users were going to write their own Puppet or Chef scripts, and so this wasn't a big deal. But in, as we moved forward, we, we had the Ceph deploy thing. We now use a lot of Ceph Ansible. We may in the future start using a lot of Rook, which is the Kubernetes operator for storage from the CNCF. And other partners like SUSE uses a thing called DeepSea, and none of these package installation and cluster configuration systems get tested in our nightlies, which means that they might be doing something wrong and we don't ever notice it. Um, first of all, finally, well not finally, performance testing is very important. We're a storage system, like we're a distributed storage system, so no one expects us to get 100% of every IOP on visible to every client, but they do get angry if we degrade performance by 15% from release to release, and we really don't have any way to do that in Toothology right now. And finally, scale testing is not really feasible. Um, it's an, like Toothology's integra integration testing system. We have that expectation that tests will finish within hours or else the scheduling doesn't really work right and we want them to run as little space as possible because we always want more space. There are some proposed solutions and some things that we've actually done. So we, ha we aren't doing it yet, but we are talking about, you know, this week, or yes, yeah, so this next week, we're, we're, we're going to talk about starting to do things like we want to expand the Toothology framework API so we can restart in signal using the init system instead of issuing commands like, hey, kill all dash nine on this particular node over there. 
or hey, run Ceph OSD with this sets of arguments on that node over there and make sure that it doesn't die. Um, we are talking about, on Wednesday morning, although we haven't announced it yet, we're talking about writing a new API within the Toothology framework so that we can request installs and then they can be satisfied by a thing that installs using stuff Ansible or a thing that installs using Rook and Kubernetes or a thing that installs using DeepSea and that the rest of the tasks don't care about that and just get given an install and we can switch to new ones as they become important and we actually test that these behave correctly. Um. We don't have a great solution to performance testing right now. Um, and so in the short term, we're, we actually have a new performance suite, which is running the performance test that we do have from another solution. But you know, it runs on random nodes in the system. So we're, try, we're gathering data right now and seeing, hey, can we like have this performance test fail if it's 10% slower than we expect? Or is that going to turn up every third run? Things of that nature. In the long term, we really need to do some kind of analysis solution based off of the performance numbers and the nodes that they run on and the variations that we've seen and do an alerting, but that'll be some kind of machine learning thing which we just don't have the, have the expertise or knowledge to do right now. Um, finally, for scale testing, we, we made a decision that actually an integration test framework is, is not a good place for, for long-running scale tests because, you know, it's an integration system. So in the, both in the community and within companies that build products around it, we're, we've got groups that are designing tests to run longer term in their own lab allocations. We might slice out part of the CPU lab for some of these and from time to time. They might, you know, we might get space from heart, from, from partners or from downstreams, but and that's the immediate solution. And we'd also like to, in the medium term, figure out how to mock up tests that simulate longer term systems. For instance, in Ceph, usually the amount of data in the system is not where our problems come from. Problems tend to come from things like our S3 compatible object solution having too much metadata for the system to handle correctly, but the actual data objects are fine. So we can start like injecting very large metadata indices and then making sure that those behave correctly without having the data to back them up. But none of that exists yet. Um, finally, there are some weaknesses about Toothology itself, or the framework itself, not just how we use it. Um, right now, Toothology has become strongly tied to Ceph. Orchestra should be easy to use elsewhere. It's just a control system. And when TV built it, he really did design it to support other any other multi-node system. But nobody else uses it, so it's sort of gotten stuck a little more together. Um, I say should have. What I mean is, you know, to avoid this problem, it may or may not have been worth the expense. But it really would have been good to find at least one other community to use Toothology with us when we built this. Um, if you have this problem today, you should find something that exists instead of rolling your own. Um, at this point, we're not really worrying about it too much. Like, there's stable code bases that fit our needs. Switching to something would be monstrously expensive and get us very little. But we do occasionally keep our eye out and say, hey, is there some other distributed storage system that could use a test framework? Maybe you'd like to work with us, um, although we haven't gotten any takers yet. Um, another problem with Toothology is that it's strongly tied to the actual CPU lab. It's supposed to deploy anywhere, and there are other people running it. But sometimes hard-coded values like an expectation that you, that you can pull packages from a sep.com domain sneak in. And if you have your own development system because you have an old fork or something, then you can't pull it from sep.com. You need to pull from your own local service. The documentation is limited. Like we have a group of people that maintain and run the service. And they, you know, every several years go and go, go have a frenzy of up updating for some portion of the documentation. But there's a lot to work through if you actually want to set up a system. Um, so, right, okay, so there, but it's more than just other groups. Um, if you need to like write, write a test and debug it, then you have to actually write the Python on your local machine, push it to a repository that, these, that the Toothology framework can pull from. You need to have machines locked, you need to invoke that, and you need to wait through the, the, wait through the machines to get imaged and for the test to install and to run before you get, can get any feedback. You need local stuff, or you need built stuff packages now. When TV initially wrote this, we actually just all standardized on a particular dist version of a distribution, and so we could build Ceph on our machine with just make, and then it would SCP the files over to the remote nodes and invoke them directly. But that became infeasible as we got more people and as we needed to test more distributions and more combinations of things, and so we need packages now. But that means you need to wait for Ceph packages to, to appear. 
and that make, and all this stuff makes it hard for third parties to contribute and for new stuff developers to do anything with their patches because they write a patch and they're like, I don't know what I can do. I ran make check, but I don't think it tested it at all. Um, there are some solutions. Um, if we had to do this again, and this was important to us, we should have made regular teardown and set up part of what we do. We have a lot of you know, infrastructure and configuration as code, but we don't invoke most of it very often. Um, we have, in the past, found groups that came to work with us, and they had trouble with setup and install, and we sort of did a one-time one walkthrough with them to help them get going, and we didn't take a lot of that back or, and, and make changes to the system to, to prevent it being a problem in the future. We made some paint changes like the packages deliberately, but maybe we should have considered how people who didn't have lab access would, would be able to respond to that and done some kind of workaround or bifurcation or whatever. And in the past, we actually had someone write something called Tuthology OpenStack. And that was pretty cool. It was a simple script you could invoke from wherever. They, and, and if you had access to, a, to an OpenStack cluster, like including a public one, it would set up a Tuthology instance and run a suite and then shut down and archive the logs to some storage system. So you could, you could just do one-shot tests. But it had a few problems. Um, the person who was most interested in it moved on to other things. The, the, the OpenStack APIs at the time were, were ludicrously unstable and unworkable, so it used the OpenStack CLI commands directly. But those have also changed since then, so it no longer really functions very well. There is at least one group still using it, but, they, it's, it, but the fork they're using, well, they did fork Tuthology to use it, and it's diverged pretty wildly at this point. Um, we have some better news. There's a thing called vstart runner. So in the Ceph repository, there's a script called vstart.shell, and it turns on a local Ceph cluster just on, on your laptop or your development box or whatever. And the vstart runner provides you a restricted API, a subset of the whole Tuthology framework API. And if you stick to that API, then it can run it against those local daemons. There's a lot of tests in the file system tree, or in the file in the CephFS file system suite that use this. There are some tests in the Rados Gateway um, S3 and Swift compatible object store suite that use this. And it means that as we hopefully transition to more of the tests being built against this API, then, lo then you know, external first-time contributors can start running tests with it on the thing that they most care about. And we are investing now a lot more work to foster a community. We, well, I, I just started a Ceph Test weekly, weekly meeting a couple of months ago to discuss things. If you're interested, it's Wednesday mornings my time in the Pacific Coast, and it's at that URL, and I'm going to start sending out reminder emails. Um, we had a Cephalicon conference several months ago in Beijing that sort of sparked this. We met a bunch of groups that we had never heard of before that were using Ceph, and, a, and several of them were like, oh, yeah, we have a development team, and we run Tuthology. And it was kind of a pain to get going, but now we've got it hard-coded to our needs, and there were like four of them, and we were like, and they they had all done, you know, their own their own localization port, and so we're trying to work with them to, or with some of those groups to get those patches back. I mean, that maybe not directly because you know they took the shortcuts too, but figure out what those patches were and what we need to change in the upstream system to make it work better. And eventually, we haven't started yet, but but there are now stable OpenStack APIs. I, I think Lib, LibCloud is, is the one that's come up and that actually works now. We'd like to rebuild Tuthology OpenStack so that we can make, so that it keeps working and it's easier for people to deploy systems. And that'll have other benefits for us too, like the ability to test the Tuthology framework itself in an OpenStack cloud instead of rolling it out to our infrastructure and hoping that nothing breaks. Um, this is sort of the performance thing that I talked about before. We don't have good trend analysis tools in Tuthology. Um, we can robustly fail individual tests by looking for core dumps, by seeing if there are errors or warnings in the logs, by having you know a task run a test condition and and failing on whatever arbitrary thing you cared about in Python. It's and it's in, and it's easy to look at the individual runs whether they passed or failed. You know, sweets show up as green or yellow or red, and then individual jobs do the same. But there's not a lot of granularity there to say, oh, a particular job has failed the last 10 times we've run it, run it. or hey, this branch is broken or whatever. Um, in the future, you know, hopefully we get to fixing this, but so far it's just not something that's been as hard enough, but it, a lot of people would, would find this to be a problem. Um, 
the sweets explode in size. Like I said, it's combinatorial. So as you keep on adding YAML fragments, it gets really, really large. The, the main Rados suite is up over 124,000 jobs now. Um, and there's no way to prioritize those tests within the framework. There's no way of saying, oh, this is a very important failure to analyze. New users don't really, or, or resource constrained users don't know what they should run. And you, it's, and you just sort of have to watch it and know whether a test matters if you're trying to get faster feedback. We do have some solutions. Um, there's a new, well, it's a couple years old now, but there's a subset functionality that that you can run so that instead of using all the combinatorial tests, it makes sure that every fragment gets used, but maybe not all of the fragments. And so you can sort and you, and you can specify, hey, I want to run subset one of 200. And as long as you then go on to run subset two of 200 and three of 200 and four of 200 all the way up, then you will eventually get the entire combinatorial test. And all of the individual pieces get run in every suite but it lets you run, run, run them down much smaller. So you can get a reasonable test system out of 397 jobs instead of a couple hundred thousand when we use this. Um, all right, yeah, so that's that. We also have other, other things we can filter um, that, so when you build a test, then it gets a name or a description that's just the names of all the YAML files. So you can filter against, you can filter and only take the tests that match a particular YAML fragment, or you can exclude the tests that match a particular YAML fragment. If you have a failure in a suite run that you decide is a problem, then you can go fix that code, and then you can rerun only the tests that failed because you think that those are gonna be the ones that are most, most useful for you. And in the future, we may do more stuff, but again, it's not become a critical issue yet. What is a critical issue for us is that scheduling is very primitive. Like I said, it's a beanstalk queue and jobs just sort of get picked off. And on the main like test node system or the test running system, we've got like, I don't know the exact number, but it's something in the neighborhood of 50 toothology worker demons that just sit there and go, hey, do you have a job for me? Oh, hey, you've got a job for me. Let me knock two, lock two nodes or lock five nodes or lock 10 nodes. And if you lock five or 10 nodes, then, you're, then you've got 49 other people competing with you and they only want to lock two nodes, they always win. Um, and sometimes, because it's just a queue, we'll have nightlies get scheduled, but you know, I get impatient and I jump, jump the nightly queue with, with my test run, and then a week later, the scheduled nightly, nightly job actually start getting picked off the queue. But at that point, you know, it's the Ceph Shaw one on Master Branch from a week ago, and we're running it through now. But oh, by the way, we just, like tw 20 minutes ago, scheduled a new run on this week's code. And that's just not very useful because eventually this, the queue gets backed up enough that we start killing nightlies, but we've tested our old code and not our new code. There are, and this is sort of an il illustrative of, of an issue. So we've gotten several hacks and we talk every several months about how this is a problem, but then if you ask someone what problems they have with Duthology, they forget about this one because our minds have sort of been molded to it. So this is something you wanna be aware of when you're building test systems. Right now, all of our jobs run on two nodes because, you know, we can mostly squeeze our jobs down into two nodes and then they all, and then they actually get executed. Um, one of our QE people looks at the Beanstalk queue and says, oh, it's like 7,000 jobs long now and we have three, three Rados nightly runs in there, so I'll just kill the two oldest nightly runs. Um, in the soon, it's not done yet, but a really easy fix is to do something a little more intelligent with the locking, where we where, where the workers can can order up can order up and queue for locking and say, hey, I need five nodes, and then we wait for five nodes, and then those get locked before you try and execute any other tests. Um, in the future. We've, we're not quite sure how it's going to how it's going to happen yet. We've talked about actually just switching to Kubernetes, and the, and it can solve some of these problems. But we really need to write a more robust scheduler, or you know, install a more robust scheduler, so that we can do more intelligent things. Oh yeah, I've only got like two minutes left. Good thing I'm almost done. Um, <laughs> And then, you know, we want to be more intelligent about the way our nightly runs work. So are we going to stick with it? Well, yes, we're keeping our tests. It's proven effective over seven years. We're, we're incredibly stable for, for the things we're doing. We've got it running right now. It doesn't take a lot of maintenance to keep doing working the way it is working. Um, but we are actively exploring ways to make it better for new users and, and developers. Should you do automated testing? Yes, you should do automated testing. But let me tell you, you should probably not write your own framework. There are a lot more of them available today than there were seven 
seven years ago, and a lot of projects have, over the last decade, written custom frameworks. So if you want to build your own framework, you, you should think real hard about it. Are you really sure something doesn't work for you? If you're really sure, then like, isn't there something that does mostly what you do? What do they do? Why is what they do insufficient? And what makes your needs different from other people's? You need to answer all these questions before you build your own testing framework or you're doing the wrong thing. Um, if you answer those questions and you're really sure you need to, you know, do the simplest thing you can. Small frameworks can always be combined into larger ones and try to keep your components discrete so they can be replaced later. That is the end of my talk. For more information, a lot of URLs. And we have like 30 seconds for more questions. <laughs> um, do we have a mic? I'm getting angry at this Hi, so uh, I mainly wor I work on Fedora QA, so I'm generally interested in integration testing. So something I notice often comes up with systems like this, I'm guessing the system is mainly built to test a potentially broken Ceph in a known good environment. Like you have known good Fedora environments, known good Ubuntu environments, and then you mm -hmm. run an unknown Ceph code base on those. Is it possible to sort of invert the flow so you run a known good Ceph in a possibly broken environment? And if not, have you thought about that? Uh, we haven't thought about about it, we we at this point we freshly freshly image all our machines for every test because doing that when you're trying to test your system is really obnoxious. But you could build broken images and run the test against that and see what happens. Right. <laughs> so we, you can at least sort of drop in images. So. I mean, I mean, it's it's not something we've ever ever discussed or actually tried. But yes, we could drop in a broken image okay. and, and see That's what happened to it. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, how difficult is it to deploy to Duology on a to test the stuff cluster? Question is how difficult is it to deploy to Duology to test the stuff cluster? Yeah, so it's it's pretty difficult. Um, I haven't ever done it personally. If you go way back in time, using the Tuthology OpenStack one made it pretty easy. And I think maybe if you go grab Sousa's fork, it still is. Um, but I haven't actually done that myself. And there's a whole lot of services running here that we just sort of tangentially pushed on, like the service that builds Ceph, that builds Ceph packages, the service that hosts and serves them up, the Pat service that the Pulpito service that stores job results. It's not, not as easy as we'd like it to be. But if you're interested, we would love the input on what makes it hard. Do you, do you get 100% test passes on commits, or do you aim for something lower? Um, do we get 100% test passes on commits? Not quite. We So sometimes, like, like, we just run enough jobs that, honestly, we notice whenever a package repository goes away. And so it's not unusual to have, like, w one or two jobs out of a couple hundred fail on that just because of some network blip or connectivity issue. Um, we, when there are failures, we audit them, and we don't, we don't merge any any anything with new failures. But sometimes we do have known failures in a system that are pending on some other PR, and we merge and we merge in that state. That has punished us in the past, sometimes pretty badly. So, like, there's a reason people say you should be 100%. We're a lot closer to it than most systems like us that I know of, but we don't we don't have a 100% programmatic requirement. It's all human driven. All right. Well, I'll be around wearing a Ceph shirt for the rest of the day and also tomorrow. So, come grab me if you want to have any questions. And thanks for your time.